The beginning was the Native Americans. The Native Americans in that area were the Kumia, K-U-M-E-Y-A-Y. They established a village which we called Kosoi, C-O-S-O-Y. Does everybody know where the large flag with the Presidio fell stands? They think Kosoi is on the other side of that hill. There's been different archaeological digs on where Kosoi was, where it is, but they think someplace on the other side near Mission Valley. They lived in relative peace and harmony, and they traded with other Native American groups. Uh, the area stretched from the ocean all the way into the Quia Mapis. They traveled to places where food was available, meaning at one time the San Diego Bay had things like salmon, lobsters, oysters, um, and they obviously fish, and they would be there a majority of the time. And they might travel to the Quia Mapis to get things like acorns and hunt wild game. So they would travel throughout, being more semi nomadic. But they did establish a village very close to where Old Town stands. Um, again, their territory stretched throughout San Diego. I believe today there's 27 different groups that make up the Kumeyaay uh, community as a whole today. Um, the first Europeans actually to change the way of life of the Kumeyaay were, does anybody know? The Spanish. The Spanish came in 1542. Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo came in, sailed into San Diego Harbor, um, put his flag down for Spain, and was here for a few days, and then left. The next explorer to come here was a man named Sebastian Vizcaino. He came in 1602 and actually named this area San Diego. He uh, saw no reason to stay. He was just another explorer, was here a few days, and left. It wasn't until uh, the, the mid-1700s that there was a need by the Spanish to actually create permanent settlements up and down the coast of California. They saw a threat, and that threat was the British um, and the Russians creating outposts in Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. One of the, those outposts still stand today and that is Fort Ross. It's a state historic park near the town of Jenner, about 40, about, uh, actually about 100 miles north of San Francisco. That was a Russian outpost established in 1812. So because of this threat, the Spanish decided, let's create these outposts. So they sent an overland group and established these outposts up and down the coast of California. Do you know what these outposts might be? called to this. Missions, very good. So these missions went up and down the coast of California along with four forts. And these forts were known as presidios. And these presidios were established and troops were garrisoned at these presidios along with these missions. The mission's goal was to actually A, promote Catholicism, and B, to try to be self-sufficient. In doing so, they had a few citizens of Spain come and, um, and they were artisans for the most part, but they needed a labor force. So with that labor force, they convinced the Native Americans to become that labor source. And how that negotiation went was, I'll provide you cast iron, textiles, materials, in exchange for things like the labor produced Adobe Block. Why the mission was established where it was, and that, that mission, again, was established in 1769 on the hill, along with the Presidio where the flag falls. Why that location was actually uh, chosen was because you had the San Diego River very close. You had a permanent water source. You had ships able to come in and out of the harbor um, to be supplied. And you had fertile ground in Mission Valley and a defendable location on the top of the hill. So for all of those reasons, that's why the mission was established. And again, established by a man named Father Sarah and Gaspar de Portola, who was a soldier. The mission was established in the Presidio, and again, co 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 convincing the labor force, which was the Native Americans, to do a lot of the manual labor in order for the uh, mission to exist there. And that started in 1769, 
up until 1821. You may or may not know what problem that did occur is the Native Americans didn't necessarily want to um, convert to Catholicism. Many of them left the area. There was a lot of strife. Um, in areas south of the Haight, there was actually uprisings that occurred. And many times the soldiers were sent throughout the community to try to bring the Native Americans back. The mission only stood where it did at the Presidio for about five years, and then it was moved to where you see it now off Mission Village Road in, I believe, 1775. So that was the new mission site, as you know today. So that mission way of life uh, went on from 1769 up until around 1810. Um, in 1810, a change occurred in the Old Town community and in all of the Southwest. There was a war, and that war went on from 1810 to 1821 between Spain and the citizens of present-day Mexico. That war went on for 11 years, and after that war ended in 1821, all the Spanish property, which included California, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, parts of Colorado, and Mexico today, all became Mexico. The Republic of Mexico is then formed. So all that property now is part of Mexico, and now the soldiers who were working for the Spanish, under the Spanish flag, have the option to either go back to their place of origin, which could be any place in the world where they came from under the Spanish flag, or to stay and continue working at the Presidio under the Mexican flag. At that time, most of the soldiers had intermarried with the Native American women, and their whole way of life since 1769 was at the Presidio and at the, um, at the mission. So as a result, the soldiers just basically took off their Spanish jacket which was a leather jacket, and then put on the new uniform of the Mexican government and continued serving as peacekeepers for about four to six years. Um, actually, it was more like almost 10 years. So again, Mexico is a brand new republic. So they need to build up their treasury. So how do they do that? Well, the first thing they do is they give land to prominent individuals throughout the community to create these ranchos, as we may or may not know, throughout San Diego. Also, as the soldiers were retiring, they had to get compensated in the form of retirement. Mexico's a brand new country. They don't have any money. So what they give them is this famous, the land grants of San Diego. And that's where you see all these ranchos that kind of pop up. Also, Mexico, again, needs to build up their treasury, so they encourage merchants to go and create Old Town, as you see today. And it was a natural evolution that this community be built up just on the downslope of the Presidio and the mission site. So as a result, uh, people started building these structures in their ranchos in the outlying areas for their homes, but they also built their townhomes in Old Town today. Now, that's the forefathers of the community where these soldiers that came down off the hill and started building their townhomes in Old Town, but they also had their ranches in the outlying areas. Like, for instance, not that far from here, Rancho Penasquitos. There's a ranch home there. They also had a home down in Old Town also. So as a result, these homes started being, being built in Old Ham. Now, one of the problems with that is Old Ham, by that time in the 1830s and 40s, we don't have a lot of wood. Um, but we do have a lot of mud, and we have the San Diego River. So as a result, a lot of those structures were made of adobe. And adobe became the building block of the early homes in Old Ham, San Diego. And adobe is a mixture of mud, straw, sometimes cactus juice, water. Those, that mud concoction is put into forms about 16 inches long, 5 inches wide, 4 inches deep. And it's actually sun-baked. It's not put in a kiln. And those blocks are placed on top of each other. Many times those blocks will be plastered on the outside of the wall. 
with a mixture of lime juice and, sea sh and seashells. Um, so the lye would actually break down the calcium carbonate and create a white slurry, and that was the kind of first paint that you would have seen in Old Town. So that's why you see in Old Town these first structures, which are adobe, which in some areas they're mud on the inside, but almost all the time they're white on the outside. And that was the first homes that you see being built by the soldiers in Old Town, San Diego. Um, again, and that was the town that kind of started springing up. You had just a few merchants coming in. In the 1830s, they, the Mexican government gained Pueblo status. It's kind of like cityhood, and that reached about 325 people. And again, in Old Town, that status was from all the way from Oceanside into Ensenada. That was the whole city. Again, this is Mexico. There was no border. So you had 335 people living in the Old Town community at that time. Um, now, how did they make all their money? So these soldiers had their ranches in the outlying areas. Yes, they had some crops, but for the most part, they brought in cattle. And this cattle was grazed on this Mediterranean bunch grass that you see in the area. It was slaughtered, not so much for the meat, because we only have 325, 335 people, one cow can feed the entire cow. So the cows were slaughtered. Many times the hides were brought to the beach or what they call the La Playa. They were prepared, and the hides went on ships from all over the world to go back east or actually to England. Um, the fat was also taken from the cows, and the fat would be rendered and sent to Chile, believe it or not. Because in that time, in the 1830s and 40s, they had a robust silver mining activity going on there, and they needed cow fat in the form of candles to illuminate the caves and the tunnels that you see go, that you would go into as you were mining there. So the hides went back to the East Coast. They were sold anywhere from a dollar to two dollars in Old Town. And what came back were all the finished goods. So you had cast iron, textiles, salt, sugar. It was very much a single source economy that happened in Old Town, probably from about 1790 up until 1840. It was known as the hide and tallow trade. It was so popular, uh, this single source uh, economy, those single hides were exchanged and called California banknotes. Has anybody heard that before? California banknotes? Yeah. Uh, and you can actually see one of those if you go to our interpretive center called the McCoy House in Old Town. We have one of those banknotes on display. So uh, that hide and tallow trade continued. Um, a majority of the people living and working in an old town um, still were Catholic because you had the mission still uh, operating um, up until the 1830s uh, at that point. And then the Presidio basically fell into ruin at that time and a civil form of government was established. When that uh, civil form of government what took place in old town, you had things like a mayor that was established, and at that time it wasn't called a mayor, it was actually called the Asiamento. Um, so the soldiers then were not needed at that point, and so people went to the Presidio and pilfered things like tile and anything they needed to improve their home itself. Um, and so the, the, the Presidio wasn't in use at that time. Where you went in the 1830s were private homes to pray. It wasn't until, or the mission site, which was eight miles east, again on Mission Gorge Road. A priest could visit Old Town and give a, um, a sermon or a, um, a mass at that time. But it wasn't until 1850 where you had the old Adobe church that was built on Harney Street where you had a permanent church that replaced the actual mission site that was in Old Town itself. Um, again, in the 1830s and 40s, the majority of the people were Catholic. All the activities revolved around the Catholic Church. Uh, that means birthday celebrations. Um, the dress was very simple at that time. 
the people at that time period did not call themselves California, I'm sorry, did not call themselves Mexicans, they called themselves Californios. Has anybody heard the term Californios? Yeah, yeah they, they basically adopted a little bit different dress. They didn't necessarily agree with the colonial form of government that was established by Spain in Mexico. It's the same thing if you go to southern Germany, the folks don't necessarily call themselves Germans, they call themselves Bavarians. So this California culture kind of arose, a little bit different clothing, they ministered their justice a little bit different. Um, at that time, all the land was divvied up and the maps were called Desenios, which later became a problem in, uh, in um, trying to get their land grants actually verified with the American courts. A typical Desenio might be, my property was from this rock to this ridge to this river to this stump. And that's how they kind of plotted out their ranches and their, um, and their property itself. Um, this way of life uh, continued in Old Town. Very few merchants, again, 335 people living in Old Town. Uh, you had ships coming in and out of the harbor with trade goods. But it was basically a small seaport. You did have a small whaling industry that was going on in and out of California and otter hunting that went on. Um, but for the most part, it was kind of a little bit sleepy town. And that, again, changed in 1845. Does anybody know what happened in 1845? No, you got it. Mexican-American War. Yeah, the Mexican-American War. Um, again, Texas won their independence in 1836 with the Battle of the Alamo. And when they did that, they became a republic. And in 1845, they petitioned the United States to be part of the Union. And in doing so, the United States said yes. But the United States wanted the border to be the Rio Grande. The Mex Mexican government said no, we want the border to be the Nueces River, which was north. As a result, a battle ensued down at that border, and we declared war and sent thousands of troops into Mexico and a small contingent to go from Texas into New Mexico, Arizona, into California, and the one specifically here in the San Pasqual Valley in December 1846. That battle ensued, a couple battles in California, and the war ended in January 47 with the Treaty of Cuenca in December, I'm sorry, in January 47 in Los Angeles. The, the war did not actually end until 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So if you go to Los Angeles, you can actually see that treaty site um, where they actually signed that treaty ending the Mexican War. With that, that same year of 1848, what happened that changed all of California? The gold rush. So you can only imagine if gold was discovered 18 months early, er, Mexico would have asked every European power to come and defend this land to keep this Mexico, but that didn't happen. So in 1848, in December, gold was discovered 40 miles outside of Sacramento, a place in a, a place called Coloma. That's the that's a little community as it is today. Um, it was at John Marshall's um, mill up there. So as a result, when gold was discovered, and the word didn't get out till 49, and it brought thousands of people into California. How they got here was going around the tip of South America, or they would have taken a steamer to Panama, the canal was not built, walk the 20 to 30 mile stretch across the isthmus, catch another steamer, and San Diego was the first safe port in the United States. So they were coming to San Diego to get food, hotel, lodging, before they made the 500 mile trip back up to San Francisco or, or Sacramento. So what people did at that in Old Town is they converted their family homes into restaurants and hotels. And that started the boom in San Diego. If you go to San Diego today, 
we have one of those buildings that was converted into a restaurant. It's called the Commercial Restaurant. It was a family home built in the 1840s, and it was converted around 46 for, I'm sorry, 48 to, um, to uh, work with all the miners coming in. It was a, it's a restaurant today. It's depicted as a restaurant. After the boom was done, it got used for other things, and actually including a chapel. But uh, yeah, that's the commercial restaurant you can actually see in an old town today. Well, so when the boom happened, more and more people just started pouring in to San Diego. Population, I believe in 1846 in California, was about 14,000 people. In 1856, I believe it was 221,000 people. So again, people came to San Diego to get supplies, to get ready before making that pilgrimage north uh, to, uh, to Sacramento and San Francisco. Also in the 1850s, a new man came to Old Town and decided he wanted to create a new real estate area, which is called Middletown today. Do you know who that man might be? No, William Heath Davis. He came to town and created Middletown, and he actually created a pier, and he started a coal industry here um, in San Diego. His adventure uh, only lasted about three or four years, and then it failed. Old Town was the heart of everything. In the 1850s, we also, in the 1850s, we became a state. Other places struggled. For instance, Arizona and New Mexico did not get statehood until 1912, 1913. The reason is, the U.S. government looks at Arizona, looks, looks at New Mexico, what do they have to offer? California has a coastline to defend, it has the Central Valley for growing, and it has gold. So why do we want to take on and build forts and create a government to protect these people, administer these people, when there's not much in Arizona, New Mexico, as far as resources? So when you look at movies today like Tombstone, that all existed. And it was in the 1880s, again, because you didn't have a real form of government in those areas of like Arizona and New Mexico. So what happened to Old Town in the 50s and 60s? Well, the economy diversified because you had, because you had an influx of people. You had businesses pop up. American merchants come. In the late 1850s, you have the telegraph. You also have the stagecoach coming in and out of San Diego. Um, you have the mail coming for the first time in the late 1850s. Uh, prior to that, mail was only coming via the um, U.S. Army. Um, you had the first schoolhouse popping up in the mid-1860s. So those things you think about as far as an American frontier town was started in the late 50s and continued into the 60s as it is today. I mean, as it is as it was back then. Um, we had the first schoolhouse and public school, I believe it was in 65 or 68. Now with that, kids were educated either um, in other locations throughout the country or they were educated in family homes. Um, and finally, what happened as far as education, there was a woman who was educated in Massachusetts, came to San Francisco looking for work, and she found no work here, but she found about, she heard about this little hamlet called Old Town. So she decided to come down here. She taught her one room schoolhouse. Her name was Mary Chase Walker. See, she was only here for a few years. The museum today is 85% original, and you can go and visit that today. Um, she was only here for a few years because she eloped with her school superintendent, <laughs> left the area, but came back and lived the rest of her life out here. So if you want to visit, you can visit that schoolhouse today. When you think of Old Town also in the 60s, you had the first newspaper. Uh, the San Diego Herald was the first newspaper in 1860, but it failed because if you didn't have a public school where anybody could read, why would you buy the newspaper? The UT was formed um, in the late 60s, and it became successful because people were reading. That I've actually brought a copy of their in the roll right over here for 
each visitor today. You can take it with you. This is the news in 1868. It's very hard to read. You might need to use a magnifier, but you can see what Old Town was all about in 1860, 1869 or so. Yes? Is that printed to scale, or was it? No. Um, how these were actually printed, um, the San Diego Union, again, was first created in Old Town. Uh, the first owner was a man named Colonel Gatewood. The editor was Mr. Bushyhead. And the uh, newspaper was went very well, but then it was moved as the building, I'm sorry, as the newspaper expanded, they moved to different buildings. And in doing so, they kept the original structure of the UT and they ran it as a museum until the 1980s. When the last curator left in the 1980s, they left 10,000 of these copies for the park to give out to groups like yourself. So we have these copies. So the, the long answer is no, this is not the original size. But it kind of gives you an, an idea of what happened in Old Town in 1868, 69. Also, what's very interesting, it, it was a weekly paper, and the reason why it was a weekly paper, it was one or two days to gather the news, one day to set all the font, that's the little blocks that you see, either made of metal or wood, and they're individual letters. Those letters have to create sentences, sentences have to create paragraphs, paragraphs have to create columns, columns have to create stories, and then it was one day to drive and one day to sell. And it was an expensive newspaper because, again, not everybody could read. So as a result, uh, people would buy the paper and read it to a group of people. So they knew that they couldn't necessarily sell a whole bunch of newspapers. So again, in the 1860s, you had uh, the stagecoach coming in. You had actually a civil form of government established by the United States um, where you had a courthouse established, you had a sheriff. You have the telegraph there. You have the first public schoolhouse. So this American way of government that kind of we know today was forming at that time period. Um, also in the 1860s, you had an <laughs> entrepreneur coming here. Does any, and he's very famous in Old Town and San Diego history. He was originally from Wisconsin. Where? Horton. That's right. Alonzo Horton came to town originally from Wisconsin. Came to San Diego and wanted all of San Diego to move the seven miles south to where it is today in the downtown area. No one wanted to move it. Yeah. Because you had the hub of society for 60 years in Old Town. Why would you move? Well, Horton decided to give a new building to the county of what's that called today? Hawaii. Uh, John Spreckles was a sugar magnet and he grew a lot of his sugar or got a lot of sugar from the Sandwich Islands, came to San Diego. He started the trolley line in and around San Diego. He wanted to extend his line into Old Town, but he needed a reason why. So as a result, he bought La Casa de Estadio, which is our large hacienda in the middle of the park, um, and started a conversion of that building. He had the idea of converting that building uh, because there was a famous book in the 1880s called Ramona, where two mythical characters actually got married in the Adobe Chapel. Very, very famous book. So he bought that building. He hired a woman named Hazel Waterman, who made a lot of conversions to the building itself to make it more reminiscent of the, of the 20th century versus the 19th century. I'll give you some ideas. Typically in the 19th century, you didn't need a fireplace in Old Town. No, it doesn't get below 50, doesn't get above 80. You have these thick adobe walls in the Estadio house. Um, so as a result, um, you didn't need these fireplaces. You had braziers. And braziers are these large circular ob objects where you actually have olive pits that you would put in this brazier. The Spanish imported olive trees. These pits were put in the braziers. The pits produced enough heat, and it was actually, actually smokeless and deterred mosquitoes, and that's how we heated the room. All of the haciendas, we'll call them, have an interconnecting door, so all, of, all the heat would transfer all around. 
Water we clean in, put in fireplaces, because that's what we have starting in 1900 all over the United States. That's what you want. It's just like, it's just like in the 1980s or 90s, every woman wanted granite countertops in their kitchens. So as a result, uh, the braziers were, were put in. You didn't, you didn't cook in the 19th century inside, you cooked outside. Underneath what they call a ramada in an oven, which, we, which back then they called an orno, but she decided to put in the indoor kitchen again. She decided to put tile in the walkway. She decided to put a fountain there. So a lot, if you go to the La Casa de Estadio, what you see there today is not necessarily um, indicative of what happened in the 1830s when that building was built. It was actually built in 1829 by the commandant of the Presidio when he came down off the hill, uh, Senor Estadio. So again, you had all these changes uh, that Waterman did. So, as a result, Waterman started making these changes and the building was actually opened in 1909 as Ramona's wedding palace. So you could get married there. And that went on from 1909 up until 1959. Also, you saw in Old Town, motor courts or motels popping all up around there. And you saw that in what is known as Fiesta de Reyes, uh, which is a big courtyard. There were six motor courts in and around Old Town. And you would actually take your car, go into a garage, go through an interconnecting corridor into your family room and into your kitchen. We don't have those motor courts really today in California. Um, you also had people, more and more people coming to California with the advent of the automobile. People wanted to see these old adobe structures. Um, so as a result, with that, people were traveling in and around, kind of taking souvenirs. So the state of California and the city got together in the 1950s and said, how do we preserve that? So how do you do that? We created the state park, in essence, and we bought a lot of the property, took some under eminent domain, and today we have nine structures that are original, and the rest are reconstructed. Now, nine structures that are 19th century. We have other buildings from the 1920s, and under San Diego Code, you cannot destroy them. Like, for instance, has anybody been to the candle shop in Old Town? That's a very, very famous building built in the 1920s by Milt Sessions. His daughter also worked there, known as Kate Sessions. So, uh, if you go to Fiesta de Reyes, that was built in the 20s and 30s. Um, also, if you go to Barra Barra, again, another structure that was built in the late 20s, early 30s. Um, so those structures were created. We can't just destroy them and mow them down. Um, where other parks that are private parks, they actually do that. Like, for instance, if you go to Williamsburg, that's a totally private park, and their time period is late 19th century, late 1700s. So they have buildings that are 1820s and they actually take them down and rebuild a structure in the late 1700s. Because they have this really tight, tight time period uh, that they want to reflect. So Old Ham basically came about in 1968. It was open um, and we today are a very, very popular park. We're one of 280 parks in the state park system. Now, before we go into uh, the what is Old Town today, does anybody have any questions about kind of the history? Yes. Is there the name of the war between the Spanish and the Mexicans, the 11 year war? Did it I don't know the name of that. Does anybody know the name of that? I don't know what the official name of that war was. Yeah. But again, it only went out of Mexico. It was also a time where Spain was losing a lot of power worldwide at that time. They basically tried to colonize and take over too much um, land, and they had to um, use other individuals from other colonies, like the Philippines and other locations, to bring people over to help stabilize these different uh, properties all over the world. In this era, 18, 18, 10, 18, 15. Right. Was 
quelled the deciding battle in the Mexican-American War, or was it just a, a battle? Oh, San Pasqual was their claim to fame. It's the bloodiest battle in California that was actually fought. Um, there were two other small battles fought in California, but in that, in the Mexican-American War, you basically had few professional military men for Mexico, for the Mexican Army. You had ranchers that wanted to keep their way of life, and those ranchers, or vaqueros, became the militia for the Mexican Army. A professional army led by Stephen Watts Carney came out uh, from the Midwest, and there wasn't really much of a war in California. Arizona and New Mexico were taken without a shot, and there were just a couple skirmishes here in California, and I would say it was very much uh, the deciding factor. But also, again, you had this professional army uh, after San Pasqual, uh, that, after that battle occurred, the soldiers actually went up to Los Angeles. You had, um, San Diego was already taken by, by Stockton at that time, and so, oh, by the Americans. Right, right. And so you had this poll going on already in Southern California. Uh, general Flores was the general at that time uh, representing the Mexican army. So you really didn't have a professional army here, and they really couldn't stop the Americans at that point. And Mexico was very much trying to defend places like Veracruz and other places where thousands of troops were battling the regular Mexican army in Mexico itself. What is the Presidio? For the Presidio was a fort. It was one of four forts established up and down the coast of California that garrisoned troops. Now you might have actually had 30, 30 soldiers garrisoned there, but they had a geographic region, so they might be at other cities within or areas within, um, within uh, Southern California, because we know soldiers that were garris garrisoned in San Diego actually went up and spent a majority of their time in Los Angeles. Yes? What, and the McCoy House, when was that built? You know? The McCoy House, I believe, was built in 69. Yeah. And James McCoy was the proprietor of this ranch out here, as my understanding, Rancher San Bernardo. I'm not sure about that. Mc, uh, McCoy's claim to fame is he uh, fought in the Mexican-American War and actually became the sheriff in Old Town. Uh, he married, built that house there. It's, it seems somewhat out of place. Um, it's the one, one of the buildings that was built at the very end of our interpretive period uh, in the 1860s. In 1874, if you saw a lot of gingerbread go on the house um, that you saw a lot of Victorian houses actually um, have at that time period. Um, and McCoy was a predominant figure. But again, in the 1860s, you had a lot more Americans coming in, seeking opportunity in the West after the gold rush, because land was cheap, land was available, um, and people were able to come to this location. What I also didn't mention, which I forgot to, um, is the structures in Old Town. Again, we talked about Adobe structures. Well, if you look at Old Town today, you have brick structures, you have wood structures. We still didn't have trees in San Diego. So what happened was people were buying prefabricated houses. And these houses were prefabricated either in San Francisco or in actually New York put on ships and then brought over here and refabricated in Old Town, put together in Old Town. The first prefabricated house in San Diego is, uh, is the San Diego Union Museum, which you can go and see today. When the Mormon Battalion came in during the Mexican War, when they arrived in January 47, the war was already over. So they did a lot of civic projects, both in Old Town and in North County here. And one of the things they think they, that happened is they built a kiln, where they started to um, fire red bricks. We have not filmed, found a kiln today, but we know a kiln did exist someplace in San Diego. 
because you had the first courthouse built in 1850 and assisted by the Norman Battalion. Yes? What was the impact of the end of the Civil War or the post-Civil War on the Confederate um, Old Town was considered actually a pro-Confederate um, area, but we did send a group of California, I think it was the first Californians, to go out to fight for the Union because we came in as a free state and a Union state, we sent people to that location wherever they were going to fight. There was no, no battle ever in California during the Civil, Civil War. The farthest west it came was a place called Picacho, Battle of Picacho. Um, you had Union troops actually posted in the um, current mission site. And that's as far as you saw soldiers being posted. You did have soldiers, a few soldiers coming in and out of Old Town. But the greatest impact you saw as far as soldiers in Old Town was during the Mexican War, where you had hundreds of troops, whether it be Marine or Army or Navy, coming in and out of that location at different times. When you say Picacho, you're talking about Picacho Peak? Yes. 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 And again, Dragoons, we're talking about this is what they would wear. This is a Dragoon uniform, again, 1845. And if you come to our sister park, which is San Pasqual Battlefield, located in the uh, San Pasqual Valley, this is what our living history uh, volunteers and staff, majority of them wear, which is a Dragoon uniform. Any other questions about the, oh, yes, sir. What time period were they bringing? Lumber down from Northern California. 1860s. Well, that's pretty early. Yeah. I think it was late 60s. You had lumber coming in in the reports there. Yes. Do you know where or how the name California originated? I believe it was from California, and it had to do something to with South America. Yes. Means of transportation was it wagons or? The trains did not get to San Diego until the 1880s. It actually, the trains bypassed uh, San Diego, came to Los Angeles, I believe, in the 60s. So they come in wagons? So people were coming, the most common way of getting people here was still by ship. If you're coming across, um, across the country, yes, you could come in wagons or horses, but ships, freight, Imagine all your freight had to come in a wagon. It was too, I'm sorry, in a ship. It was too costly to put on a wagon, per se. And you were coming long distances crossing the desert. You did have different stagecoach lines coming in and out of San Diego. Albert Seeley was the person that was moving a lot of freight and a lot of people in the 1860s, mid to late 1860s, in and out of San Diego. What killed Seeley's stage line was the train. That's right. And that's where you see the advent of Union Station and the trains coming in and out of San Diego itself. Any other questions about the history? Okay, what is Old Town today? Again, in the 1860s, I'm sorry, 1960s, you had the state park uh, being created in essence. We had a few existing adobe structures. We had some buildings left in the 1920s and 30s. So a lot of preservation went on, a lot of new construction went on, and buildings were recreated based on images. And those images were photographs. And the first photographs of Old Town was a man named Schiller. And he was the first big photographer in the 1860s to take a lot of photos of Old Town. And you could actually look those images up in the San Diego Historical Society, the Schiller Photograph Collection. Um, Old Town then started garnering attention from the public, uh, from volunteers, and as a result, they have built up what they call a living history program. The living history program are people like myself, whether it be staff or volunteers, who dress in what we call period clothing. Um, and period clothing is clothing that reflects a specific time period. It's not necessarily a costume. When you think of a costume, a costume is maybe what a clown wears. It doesn't reflect a specific time period in history. So this is reflecting the time period of history, obviously minus my glasses. 
So this is what a typical man would wear in the 1860s. You would have trousers um, and a, a vest with that, a, or at that time called a waistcoat, a white simple cotton shirt. You didn't necessarily have polyester at that time period, more plastic. So everything was either cotton, wool, duck, linen, um, for as far as material. Buttons were made of metals, metal, glass, coconut, um, sometimes shell, and bone. Um, and you had a lot of felt, a lot of wool worn at that time period. Um, and then you also had women wearing full length dresses. You didn't see shorter dresses until the 1920s come to in fashion by a woman named Audrey Hepburn. So you always saw long flowing dresses because it just wasn't in style. It wasn't in vogue at that time period until you saw Hepburn starting to wear trousers and stuff. We also have, in this Living History program, we have activities going on during the weekends. And every weekend, we usually have these Living History activities, and I've left this brochure in the back, and it identifies all the Living History events. Like, for instance, last week, we had a contra dance where we had 10 or 12 volunteers, a live band, and we had a contra dance, otherwise known as square dances. This weekend, we have our embroidery guild there, and we have period cooking. So every weekend, we do these activities in period clothing to try to demonstrate to the public how life was between 1821 and 1872. Now, some of the clothing we wear reflects the Mexican culture, which again existed from 1821 to about 1852, because the Mexicans did not leave the area. They just assimilated into American culture for the most part. Some of them after the Mexican War will have to go into Mexico, some of them stayed. Uh, and then we have people representing the American period, like what I'm dressed today. Um, and we have these activities that go on every weekend. In addition to the activities every weekend, we have large special events, and we have 14 to 16 events that go on during the course of the year. And specifically, there's events that I run, called, which is called Stagecoach Days. And I'll pass out this card, and we have cards for everybody in the back that you can take. And again, there are different themed events revolved around different uh, specific time periods or pieces of history in Old Town. Like, for instance, Trades That Shape the West focuses on different trades that happen there in Old Town. We also bring different groups of people in to do demonstrations. Like, for instance, we have a real wife from Arizona coming. We have, um, we've had in the past a main right who makes um, wheels and carriages. He came from Salinas. So we get funding from different locations in order to bring these outside groups in, in order to get, give a larger slice of history focused on one specific topic or theme and we hope people will come back month, week after week to learn about that piece of history. All of our activities are free. Um, of the original structures, we have five major museums that you can actually go and visit today, and they're all free. And I've also brought a brochure, and this brochure identifies, again, a brief history of Old Town and some of the major buildings that we actually have in Old Town today, and what everybody loves is the map of Old Town that you can see here. Um, Old Town is generally open from 10 to 5 every day, and what I highly encourage if you visit Old Town is come to the visitor center, get a quick overview, and then we have the McCoy House, as Mr. Rossi asked a question about. That was developed in 1998, um, structure, and then it was completed in 2007, the interior displays and things like that, where it, it will give you a timeline of history. Meaning, it'll talk about the Cumia, the Spanish, the Mexican slash California culture, the American impacts, and finally the fire that devastated Old Town. Um, and that will give you the overview, and then you go out into the park itself, where you go to places like the commercial restaurant, and you get that in-depth slice uh, the restaurant history. So what you see from the outside is what you get on the inside. So it's a real place to educate yourself. Why is Old Town significant? 
And this is kind of my take home the message that I'll kind of end with. Um, Old Town itself, we talked about the Kumeyaay, the Spanish, the Mexican, and the American impacts there. But it, that is very much indicative of what happened in every community in California, whether it be Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Um, and you can see all those changes architecturally in Old Town. First the Spanish Mission and Presidio, then the adobe structures that represent the, the Mexican or slash California culture, and finally the American impacts. So it's a, a place for folks like yourself and people from all over the country to come and learn about that piece of history which happened all over California, all in one place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions people have? Go ahead. The, the motor homes that you said about 1920. Motor courts. Motor, motor, motor yes. Courts. So the little shops that go around that plaza area in Casa de Reyes, those, each of those. Yeah, because it's funny, if you go to the back side, you'll see these blue garage doors. <laughs> You can go to the back side of that building and see these garage doors, and that's where people would pull their cars in, park their cars, go through the interconnected corridor, you'll see these small rooms, those were the bathrooms. And there was a bedroom and a family room. And that was called the Pico Order Court. Uh, there's a place called Walla Bowman Square, which is near Twig Street. It's a U-shaped U -shaped set of buildings. It's wood. That was called the Tropic Motor Court, and it was considered a red light district during World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, where was that located? Uh, on Twig Street, okay. uh, Twig Street, and Old Town Avenue. <coughs> yeah, you'll see it. It was called the Tropic Motor Court. Well, I found a postcard. There was an 18, 18 foot fountain that existed there at one time. You just have to remember, as people have structures and have building just like today. They make modifications throughout the year. What we are doing is we're trying to preserve that, what was there between 1821, and we pick 1821, because that's when Mexico took a foothold in San Diego in 1872, because that was the fire in the Exodus. And that's what we call our interpretive period. That's what we focus our time on. Our clothing is really focused really between 48 and 68, for the most part. So the Tropic Motor Court, um, that's still there. There was the Young Motor Court, which is near the old El Fandango today. So again, Old Town, when you look at it today, all the buildings are owned by the state of California by yourself. Uh, nine of the buildings are museums. The rest are leased out to individuals. Um, they're known as concessionaires, and there are partners today. Is anything going to happen with the Fandango building? Right. The El Fandango is a structure, at one time, what was there was the Magnolia Saloon in the 1880s. What you have in the very back is actually an apartment that was built in the 1930s. So we have to preserve that property. The woman that ran that property was, is now 80 years old. She did not want to renew her lease at that time period. At that time. And the problem is there's so much work that's needed to that El Fandango. Whoever gets that building has to do a lot of work to it, and they don't own the building. So potentially in 10 years, they put, let's say, $500,000 into that building, then they have to walk away. And that's something hard to sell to a new restaurant, restaurant tour coming in, is take on a building, put on all those capital improvements, then walk away after 10 years. So it's just going to stay like this? Well, they're talking about different things that they may or may not do. Like, for instance, it's not an historic frontage. So they're talking about destroying the building itself, leaving the 1930 structure, and making it a large venue to have uh, special events in. Like, for instance, when you have here weddings. So uh, to create more green space in the park itself. Wasn't that someone's home or wrong? Uh, there, you're getting confused. There was a building in the back of what is now known as Threads. Threads was an old, in the 1950s, 
It was an actual general store run by Willie Manlow and her husband. Then it became a gift shop when her husband died in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Mrs. Manlow lived in the back, and she was grandfathered in. When she passed away, her daughter did not want to run that as a store. She gave it to the park, and that person that lives there is actually a state park employee who's in charge of maintenance uh, for the park itself. So there's a water leak. She has to respond to that. That's the only person that actually lives on the property right now. The only significant change that's going to occur in the next year is, in, have, how many people have been to Old Town in the last four years? Almost all of you. Caltrans built a massive building across the, from their old building. They're going to destroy the old building. That is now part of the California State Park, and then we're going to destroy that building. The reason why it's going to take a lot of work is there's asbestos in that building. So they have to remediate the asbestos, take down all the items in the building. It's going to be a green space. And I would like to eventually see the historic structures that went in, which included a bowling alley, believe it or not, in the 1860s. The Lion Bowling Alley. So,